Let's pray. I give you this moment of silence as a believer, priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. You know the the reason is you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and He's the great teacher. You can't He can't minister to your life the truth of the Word of God if you're in carnality. Evidence of carnality in your Christian life would be personal sin. It could be in the category of mental attitude type of sins, or sins of the tongue, or overt sins. If you're aware of any of these then you need to confess them before you study so the Holy Spirit, you can be a spiritual, it, this can be a spiritual experience of learning the Bible. First uh, John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I ask you to take part in that. As a believer priest, you need to take care of your own responsibility for spirituality. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us, both by automobile and by internet. We pray the Holy Spirit. We pray for the people on the internet that have visited with us to take the same courtesy of classroom etiquette, of spirituality, to get the thrust of the message from the Word of God by the Holy Spirit into their souls that will become the dynamic reality of their life in Christ. So I pray for that. I pray also, Father, for prayer request that has come through our local group here. Uh, Tony, we pray for him as he's been rushed back to the hospital, having just come home from heart surgery. He's now sent back for another look. I pray for that. Pray for healing. Pray for great wisdom on the staff that will administer him and for the team that has gone with him spiritually. We pray, Father, for Harry Martinez and his granddaughter, that family. I know they're a spiritual people. I, I understand that they, they know exactly how to touch the throne with prayer. We, they encouraged us to join with them, and we will, uh, for their granddaughter and the, the unborn child that is ready to be born. I pray for great wisdom on their staff there. Apparently, they're really in a good situation they all feel comfortable with the team they have at Vanderbilt, the medical team, and we pray for that. For Al out at Liberty tonight, we lift him before you, Father. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth through him to his people and to their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. We're back after the Christmas break with other studies to come back to one of our original uh, series entitled The Baptisms of Jesus. And we're looking at four of them. We've already stud, studied John the Baptist baptizing Jesus and the importance of his ministry in that. Also, the Jesus' baptism of death and how it relates to us positionally, we've discussed that. Tonight, we're looking at Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then... The next time we gather, we will talk about Jesus' baptism of fire. These are the four baptisms that we have studied in this series, um, mainly because some people don't have enough clarity on these issues. Not that they're not familiar with them, but they may not have enough clarity on them. And so I felt it important to come back and look at these four key baptisms. We've chosen Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11 and 12. So if you turn there in your Bibles with me to it, we'll put our eyes on it. John the Baptist has appeared on the scene after 400 years of absence thereabout of a recognized national prophet. John is on the scene, and he is a recognized Jewish prophet, a national prophet. And we learn that in as the chapter opens in verse 1 and talks about John, and now we're down 
to one of the messages of John, a sermon. In one of John's sermon, a, a, a common theme, because he was the prophet to the Messiah, a common theme. In verse 11, he says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me, remember he is the messianic prophet. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. These are not the same thing. They are two different things. I will baptize. The only thing common is Jesus and baptism. One is the Holy Spirit and one is fire. They are not the same thing. You should not coordinate them to be the same thing. They don't both occur at Acts 2. When you find the fire there, it is not this fire. This is the fire of judgment. The baptism of the Holy Spirit by Jesus is the first coming. The baptism of fire is his second coming. Remember in the Old Testament or under that old covenant teaching method, they didn't know a first and second coming of Christ. They taught one coming of Christ. And then he talks about the fire in verse 12. A wintering fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into the barns and he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. That's the baptism of fire, okay? What we're going to talk about is the first one, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. And John made it very clear what the fire was, and so we should not have any more dispute about that, okay? Uh, while some people do, th there shouldn't be, okay? The first one, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is in the first coming of Christ, the first advent. And the baptism of fire is connected to the second one, his second advent. What is interesting to most of us is that when you come to Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit, like in Matthew, third chapter, verse 11 to 12, at least verse 11, all four Gospels in the book of Acts talk about the baptism of fire. Now, they don't all, I mean, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is baptizing with the Holy Spirit. They don't all talk about the fire baptism, but they all talk about the Holy Spirit. For example, and I wrote some key passages, not for you to look at tonight, but later in your studies, to go and see this was a, here's my point, it was a common theme in the preaching of John the Baptist about the Messiah. <clears throat> they all record it. It's recorded in Matthew 3, 11 to 12, Mark 1, 7 and 8, Luke 3, 16 through 18, John 1, 32, 34, and it is referenced again by Jesus himself in Acts 1, 4 and 5. He says, John preached this and here's what this is going to be. And so that, that's a pretty heavy doctrine. I mean, when you get this much information about it and, it, and not all of them talk about the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire, but they all talk about the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. And there's a good reason for that is because there's a, a new covenant, new age, uh, an, a whole new system is about to be set up with the coming of Messiah. Here's a, what's interesting. Two wonderful systems. I mean, the hist history has never seen it We'll never see anything like it again. The first coming of Christ established one, and the second of Christ will establish the second one. Right? The millennial age, and then into the new, the new heaven and new earth system. I mean, both these comings are going to inter introduce, and this baptism, this, this ba both baptisms have a key in that. And it's kind of important. I'm going to deal with three points tonight in Jesus' baptism of uh, the Holy Spirit. And what I hope it will help you do is to show the, the importance of this doctrine that John preached that was connected to the first advent of Jesus Christ. And listen, let me tell you, it has everything to do with the first advent of Jesus Christ. Everything. Next to the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, this is it. 
I mean, this is as powerful out of the mouth of John the Baptist as Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Because this is the power system for those who believe that. It's the entire power system. And um, so let me begin with point one and, and show you how God, God in his omnipotence uh, in his omniscience, as we talked about last night, God in his omniscience, in planning a perfect plan, what he did and how he announced it through John the Baptist, who, who took these messianic doctrines, he took all these messianic, that, I mean, his, you know, it's just like people that really are hot on the second coming of Christ. They, they gather all these teachings, they gather all the prophecies, and, and that's a wonderful thing. John the Baptist was that way about the first coming of Christ. I mean, he knew he was the Messianic prophet. Therefore, it was important for him, like most of us, to gather all of that information and to speak it out. And, um, and so one of them, I mean, his two great themes, at least as we study the Gospels, is behold, the Lamb of God has come to take away the sin of the world, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And what is interesting, he's not going to do that until he's done the first. When you look at it historically, and we have a chance to do that in studying the four Gospels, he's got, to become, he's got to become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world before he can be the guy who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So, so what I want to do in my point number one is I want to show you that, that, that Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of six important messianic doctrines associated with the first advent of Christ because I want you to see how God is developing in his plan the coming of the Holy Spirit as well as the coming of, of the Son. Not only is it important for his Son to be revealed, it's going to be important for the Holy Spirit to be revealed. Two members of the Godhead are going to have enormous ministry responsibilities to the day in which you and I live, which are the last days. We live in the last days, and he has armed us to the tilt for it. He has, God has so equipped us that we can do it all. And any one generation of Christians that are willing to shoulder the responsibility can take it on and win the world. Think about that. Wait a minute. Don't pass this on to the next generation. We have the responsibility, the privilege, and have been adequately equipped to do it. It's not because we have the internet. It's because we have God Almighty. Everybody says, oh boy, what could we have ever done? My grandmother used to talk about that, about electricity. Oh my goodness, electricity, my grandmother, electricity. <laughs> Running water. You know what makes all this, what, none of that makes your life one way or the other. What does make your life is God. All this other stuff, he just, we're so, we're so blessed. But let me show you the six things. This is how you know you got something really big up upcoming and I want to show you these I just picked out these six because I only got one point here so I don't want to go the virgin conception by the Holy Spirit of Jesus I mean that's a big deal but if that don't happen you can forget behold the behold the Lamb of God if he's born like any other man then he's got to die for his own sin he can't die for mine and then I gave you Luke 1, 26 through 38 and the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14. Now, we just came out of a big, heavy stuff, you know, the Christmas session. This is what Christmas is about. But here's what I want you to write on your paper. I want you to write verses. Uh, I want you to write Luke 1. So you got Luke 1. I want you to write verse 34 and 35. Because what I want you to do in your spare time, I want you to go back and I want you to really pay attention to verse 3, 34 and 35. Now, that whole passage, it talks about the awesomeness of this event. 
the Holy Spirit will come upon Mary and she will conceive the child of God. But you ought to hear it explained from the divine side, verse 34 and 35. You, and, and, and listen, pay attention to it. Don't just read it and then check it off like I read it. I mean, r read it to have it read back to you. When you study the Bible, the Bible want to study you, then you study it again to find out what you've learned. Because until the scriptures study you, you've not studied the scriptures in order to be able to learn something that will change your life. I know you didn't pay any attention. It sounded too complicated, didn't it? But it's the absolute truth. We, we read the Bible, we don't study it. In order to study the Bible, you read it, you, then you let God study you, then you read it again to find out what you didn't see. <laughs> Uh, that's called the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Here's a second thing. John the Baptist, water baptism to identify Jesus as the Messiah. He goes along, he's, he's baptizing with water. Why did John baptize with water? It was the way God told him he would identify the, the Messiah. So he's, he began uh, baptizing Jews, Judean Jews. And John says, he, and, and listen, here's the verses you need to put down. J the John 1, you need to put down verse 33 and 34. It, it's a magnificent statement that he makes there. He, he, tells you, he tells you just exactly what God told him to look for, and when he saw it, he would know that that was the Messiah. You say, well, how come he didn't know that ahead of time? How do I know? You know, we always second guess everything. Yeah, that's a fair question. But listen, he tells you, I did not know. Be sure to read that. I did not know until this event. And, and of course, that, that covers Isaiah 42.1. The third spectacular thing, the third was the surpassing. The spectacular sign of mi the miracle ministry of Jesus. In his first sermon in his home synagogue in Luke 4, in verses 17 through 21, Jesus lays this out. He picks up the scriptures. He opens it to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And he says, here are the signs of the Messiah. And when you see them, you will know who he is. I mean, he lays it out there. This, in that synagogue that day, was exactly what Jesus was telling him was as simple as what God told John the Baptist when he was baptized. He said, one day you're going to baptize somebody in the Jordan, and you're going to see the Spirit of God descend out of heaven and rest upon him, and you're going to hear a voice say, and you will know, right? You know, Jews want signs, right? Gentile, Gentiles ought to seek what? Wisdom. wisdom and knowledge, yeah. Wisdom. Be good if we would, wouldn't it? I mean, we've been built for it, haven't we? We're not built for science, but we are built. Within the divine system, we're built for wisdom. Man, are, are you getting wiser in the Word of God every day? Are you getting wiser about your life in the Word of God every day? then you understand what we're talking about. Are you? Because if you're not, then you're not seeking wisdom. Not the wisdom he's talking about. So you're sitting around, must be waiting for signs or something. I don't know. Red lights, green lights, yellow lights, and then that's our life. But what you want to focus to in Luke, the fourth chapter, you want to focus on verse 18 and 21. Pay attention to those verses. When you go in there, you pay attention to him. And boy, did he not, did he not put out some spectacular miracles? <laughs> I mean, here is a dead man in a coffin on his way to the, the grave, man. Here's another man in the grave three days. 
blind man from birth. I mean, no eyes. A woman with blood disease, incurable blood disease for 38 years. Hmm? Boom. How, how miraculous was that healing? I mean, I mean, that's so far out there. And what did the Jews learn from that? Well, they should have learned that that was the Messiah because of Isaiah right in their Bible. They should have said, well, what's the Bible say? Well, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Can he do these things? Can he do these six things? Can he do them? If he can, da 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 da. Mm. How about this one? The fourth one. It, see, and, I, and I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, say, all this about the Holy Spirit. Jesus raised from the dead on the third day. Luke, the 24th chapter, 7 and 8. A f f prophecy fulfilled from Psalm 16, 10 and 11, raised from Sheol. Not abandoned my soul to Sheol. Raised from the dead on the third day as predicted. And one thing you get raised from the dead, but on the third day, on schedule. <laughs> one, the one I like is Romans. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans 8, chapter verse 11. There are a lot of verses, but this is my, you know. We all have ours. This is mine. I love this verse. Because I, lo I love them all, don't I? Uh, I love them when they apply to life because it encourages me. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. See that word if? First class condition. And it's true. If the if this is true, if the whole if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if that's true, and it is true if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for your sins was buried and raised from the dead, and you believe that's the gospel and that's the gospel that saves you. Then you've been saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And if that's what you are trusting for your salvation, then this is true. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he does dwell in you the moment you believe that he died, was buried, and raised for you. If that's a, that's a there are four different ifs in the Greek language. This means if and it's true. And I explain that. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if this is true, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, which is how was he raised from, it's by the Holy Spirit. If the spirit of him, if the spirit of him, if the spirit of God who raised him from the dead dwells in you, he, that spirit of God, who raised Christ from the dead, will also give spiritual life to your mortal body. How about that? 2 Corinthians 5.17, that's what we call you have been, uh, become, you have become a new cre creation. You, you, are, you are in a new, you are a new creation. You're no longer part of the old creation of Adam. You're in a new creation in Christ. The first Adam, now you're in the second Adam. You were born in the first Adam, now you're born in the second Adam. You've been not only born again, you've been born from above. You're not born from above is a Jewish concept. Born again, new creation is a Christian concept of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He who raised Jesus from the dead will give life. 
spiritual life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who indwells you. Is that that powerful? How did I get this? I got it because he raised Christ from the dead. When I believe that, I get him. And he brings God's life into my mortal body. The Holy Spirit dwells inside my mortal body. And my mortal body takes on a new identity. It becomes the temple of God. Right? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Five. The pre pre ascension breathing of the Holy Spirit on his disciples prepared the disciples for the advent of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you something. John, the 20th chapter, verse 22. I heard a song the other day Breathe on me. <laughs> Jeez. It's a good song. I mean, it, you know, uh, bad words always, always seem to have great music. It irritates me. It's kind of one of those you hum away and you go like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, anyhow, here we are. You know, Jesus. Now, notice how I I identify him pre ascension. Pre ascension. I am in 20, well, about from verse 19. He's with his disciples in the evening, the first day of the week. The doors are shut. You remember this? He steps in there. And then we, ha you know, that. and when he had said this, he showed them both his hands aside. His disciples therefore rejoiced. Uh, Jesus at peace. And then we got Thomas and all that comes out of this. But look at verse 22. Here's what's missed. I mean, here's what's missed. Seeing that whole thing with Thomas. That whole thing with Thomas? Look at verse 22. It, you know, he says, peace with you in the 21 and all that. He says, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, how about that? Right in the midst of that whole doubting business with his, whether he's raised from the dead, and whether they've, you know, he said, look, I got, here the, here the scale, here's the nails. Here's the nail prints. Here's the, the wound. Right? In the midst of this whole story, and listen, the story with Thomas is not through. I mean, we're still down there. And finally, he says to Thomas, reach in here. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord, my God. And he said, because you've seen me, you've believed, blessed are those who. Listen, in the midst of this whole episode, you have this little phrase. There are 10 disciples. They're not all there. If you remember the story. Well, you know, Judas is not there. <laughs> There's ten. They, they talk about him. Right? In the midst of this whole deal, everybody, listen, you got to understand what's going on. They're, 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 getting, they're getting nutty. You understand what I mean? They're getting, they're ready to flight. He's already appeared to several of the people. And nobody's believing. You do know this story. I'm not making it. Gosh, you know this story. What has often been missed in this, and it's okay, because it depends on what you're after out of a story to show people, is this statement. And this, this breathe on me, in the Greek language, this is found in Genesis 2-7 in the Septuagint. Same word in the Greek language for breathe. You know what, you know what Genesis 2-7 is about? What's about? He breathed into, he made, made him out of a clump of clay, whatever, and breathed into him, breathed into his nausea, he formed him, it f formed him and breathed into him. He had a chunk of clay. He sculpted it into a human body, right? Breathed into his nostrils the breath of Nishamahaim, the breath of lives. 
He breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. That same word in the same context is used here. Into their mortal body to hold them to Pentecost. That's phenomenal. And it's often missed, and when it's not, when it is found, it's just taken out of context. It's a magnificent. When he says receive, listen to me. You don't know say, see the word received in that verse? This word receive? It's lambano. Listen to me. It's an aorist, active, imperative, second person plural. He didn't go like, well, listen, guys, it might be good if y'all blew your nose. <laughs> because I'm about to give you first aid equipment here. Yeah. Right? Every, clean your nostrils because he went, receive the Holy Spirit of God. No, I don't know if he did it that way. I'm just telling you, it's a among the strongest commands formation of the Greek language. It's an heiress. We Colonel used to call it the Hutu command. I mean, which means you obey it. You don't question it. You don't say, sir, I have a question. There is nothing to be said. Boom, it's done. And, and it is out of the Greek culture. It is a whatever a Hutu command is. <laughs> I, mean, I was a military guy, short military guy, not by stature, but by time. Well, I guess by stature and by time. But, but anyhow, it's a w wonderful. Listen, and why, why is he doing that? Because they're just all over the place. Going to hold them. This group has got to, so they got to stay together to Pentecost. We're on a 50-day stretch here. He was raised on first fruits. We got to go to Pentecost. He's going to leave in 40 days. It's going to leave in 10 days. Listen, they're not doing well and he's with them. Commands it. And what a, what, in, and it's a, listen, it's a picture of the last Adam doing what God did with the first man. He breathed into his mortal body the breath of life spiritually. It's just, there's a lot more here than what I'm giving you, but I'm just telling you, this is a pretty dramatic moment. It's missed. One little dinky verse, one little dinky verse, and this high drama room, we got this high drama room going on, and you got this little verse that just put it all calm. I mean, he went, I mean, it's like in the boat, and he goes like, wind be still kind of business. Uh, I, just, I just love that. But another, another great ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then the ascension session of Jesus will result in Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's called in the Greek language the Paracletus ministry. It's called by different names in the English, and that's, that's unfortunate. But it's made of a compound Greek word, and uh, helper, comforter, um, counselor. I mean, there's just so many different words for this. But it's a name. It's a title. Don't, don't spend so much time worrying about what it all is. It's a title. And, and the ministry that it has, Jesus explains in the upper room discourse through John 13 through 17, he, he explains the Paracletus ministry wonderfully. John, and, and he gets into it heavy in John 14, 15, and 16. And um, I want you to write this verse down because when you go back and you look, I want you to read at least one on there that's really important. And that is John 16, 7. When he says, here's the key to the Paracletus ministry, and he is really pounding it, right? I just told you about him having to breathe on these guys, because they were, but he really pounded what is going to happen. But in 16th chapter, verse 7, listen to what it says. I tell you the truth. Mm, we're familiar with that phrase, aren't we? I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, so they can't even get the fact that he's back. 
right? If I do not go away, for if I do not go away, the paracletus, the helper, the comforter, the counselor, however your translation is, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, what is important about this little study is that the first three, I gave you six, the first three occurred before the crucifixion and the last three after. Note that Jesus told his disciples that Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit would occur within days after his ascension in Acts 1, 1, uh, one through uh, 8, or, uh, yeah, 1 through 8. He's going to tell them that. Look, this fall over there, I'm not going to, I'm not on schedule anyhow. I'm so far off where I'm. <laughs> he says, let me pick this thing up at verse 4. He says, and gather them together. Now, he's about to ascend. And so he gathers them together and he commands them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. That's in verse 4. Which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, he tells them something he has not told them before in this exact way. Not many days from now. Historically, we know how many days that is, don't we, Rick? Because he's going to leave on the 40th day from the resurrection. So we got 10 days. I mean, we know. I mean, he doesn't say in 10 days. But we know historically that's what that was. And, uh, and when they had come together, they were asking him. And it shows you how out of touch they were in class like so many people, they go to class and they never pay attention to what it is because they think they know it. You know what we used to call that in school? A person who knows it all. And what you find out a person about who knows it all doesn't know it all. They may know a lot. They don't know it all. But if you want to know somebody that does know it all, that's God. And he wears that title with honor. Omniscience. The rest of us, we're playing catch up. Well, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the epics that the Father is fixed by, by his own authority, but you receive power. Pay attention to what you have access to, not some other stuff that's out there. The ages to come, they'll come. You, you, this is not what's important for you right now. What's important for you is to grasp what is on your plate. Eat what's on your plate, not, not what's not. Here's what's on your plate, verse 8. You shall receive power in a few days, right? <laughs> not many days from now. Not many days from now. Well, what about the kingdom? What about the clouds in the sky? <laughs> Quit that. Eat what's on your plate. Here it is. Here's what's on your plate. The coming of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other parts of the earth. Eat what's on your plate, man. Well, what about, uh, what about now? What is the commission now? Listen, you want to talk about the second coming of Christ? It's good. How about getting more people aboard? <laughs> How about that? Huh? Sit around, debate the second coming of Christ, and three of them have never heard the gospel. They love hearing about the second coming of Christ. How about the first coming when he died on the cross for your sins was buried and raised from the dead and you need to believe it to be saved? How about that deal? Listen, we need to get people on the ark, not sit around and talk about how it was constructed. 
What do I care? Listen, we need to get them aboard. D eat what's on our plate. What is it? Well, this is the commission we're still under. We're under this power of the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses. Listen, he told them that in John 14, 15, and 16. He told it to them over and over and over again. He told them that he, the Holy Spirit would convict the world if they would carry the message in John the 16th chapter. If you will carry the message, the Holy Spirit will convict the people of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Who's going to carry the message is the point. Sit around and talk about gobbledygook. I mean, these are all right to talk about, but it doesn't change people's lives. It doesn't change their lives. Listen, listen, it's okay to talk about them. They're part of the structure of the overall plan of God. But if you're going to neglect what your responsibilities you have in the now, within a few days, in the now, come on. Well, anyhow. I, I, while I'm here in Acts, let's go to the second chapter. Look, look at Acts, the second chapter. Now, I, listen, listen to me. I, I know, listen, I know I'm preaching at, in my, my little church sitting right here. I know I'm preaching to the choir, as they say. I know all of you know that, and I know you're actively engaged in it. You know who I'm saying this is? People watch me on the Internet all over the world. You need to take this stuff serious. I mean, there are, there, there are doctrines that are, significantly important all over the place I'm talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life that's what I'm talking about I'm not talking about that the, the, the doctrine, doctrines are not important and the word of God is not important and that all of it is not important that's not what I'm saying I'm saying look at if you're neglecting the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life for him to teach you and guide you and direct you for you to walk in the spirit and not the flesh for him to teach you the word of God that change your life dramatically and put your feet into bringing people into the kingdom of God. That's what I'm saying about. I'm just saying, look, if you're doing it, listen, you can do it all. You can have it all, but don't neglect the major part of this. Why did Christ come? We're still in the first coming. We should be passionate about the message we have to the world. This is the world God loved that sent his son into it. I mean, this. So we're coming for you. We're sending Rick. Listen to what, listen to what Acts 2, uh, and I hope a whole lot of people. My, you know, I was talking to a, a couple of pastors that, and, and it's okay, but for me, I always have visions. Now, I don't mean I get, I get gas in my stomach and have those kind of visions. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about what maybe when I was a kid, we called them dreams. What kind of dreams and aspirations do you have? Well, I had a whole set of them before I got saved. I have a whole set of them after I got saved. I have another set of them that's completely different when I got saved that, that because of my spiritual growth maturity. But I can tell you one thing. I am passionate about winning people to Christ. We need to be about winning people to Christ. It, 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 Newborn babes desire the sincere mouth. Listen, old goats may not, but young babies do. Young babies, listen, God puts it in them. It's part of their DNA and salvation. Newborn babies desire the word of God. And, and that's who we ought to be serving, rather a bunch of old goats that don't care about nothing. Now, I don't have control over that. I just teach you gums. I mean, I'm supposed to feed the goats as well as the babies. I'm just telling you that one may not have a desire for it, but I tell you, every baby does. Every newborn has a desire for the Word of God. And as, listen, when you go out on the mission field or you go into some place where there's that desire for the Word of God, it fires the teacher up so bad he can't hardly sleep at night. He can't, hire, he can't hardly sleep at night. I, I mean, I, I just get nuts. I go home. I can't sleep. I get up. I pray. I walk around. I praise God. I can't hardly stand it. It's a magnificent thing. I mean, once you get a taste of it, it's just forever in a word. Okay. I mean, we all know this. You know, well, where was I anyhow? I was in Acts before I, before I got off on a... Listen to, listen to the second chapter, verse 33. Therefore... 
having been exalted, talking about Jesus Christ, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God, this is Jesus ascending and now in session, Therefore, having, exalted, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, the, uh, of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. We're talking about Pentecost. Isn't it interesting how that was stated? Now, Jesus talked earlier about this promise of the Father. L write these scriptures down. This will be of interest to you if that's interest. When he got back, when he was seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, listen to me now, he, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he did that. That's, the, that's, the bapti that's Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right on the money. Write these scriptures down. John 7, 39. I'm talking about the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit as the promise of it. John 7, 39. Luke 24, 49. 24, 49. Acts 2, 17, which talks about Joel, the prophet Joel. Galatians 3, 14. And Ephesians 1.13. These are dynamite. Because it is interesting. You want it one more time. John 7.39. Luke 24.49. Acts 2.17. Where he talks about Joel, the book of Joel. The prophet Joel. Uh, Galatians 3.14. And Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 1.13 should kind of excite you. And so I'm going to read it to you just so I can see you get a little excited. In him, positional truth, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth of the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Look at that. Sealed by that promise. In the fourth chapter of this same book, in the fourth chapter of this same book in verse 30, he tells you how long you're sealed. Sealed until the day of redemption. Now he's not talking, he's talking about the whole kit and caboodle now, he's talking about the resurrection business. And that, listen, there again the promise. The Holy Spirit, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. One of the eight works of the Holy Spirit. Now you say to me, Pastor, how do we know there, that there, there's 50 days? I wrote on your paper, Leviticus 23, 15 and 16. And it will tell you that Jesus was raised on the first fruits. That, that, that's the Sunday. And 50 days from first fruits was Pentecost. That's 50 days. Pentecost is the word 50. And he's going to leave. Acts 1 tells us he's going to leave to go back to the Father 40 days after his resurrection. That leaves 10 days. That's, that's my math at the bottom of the page. Well, we decide where I ought to go. So let me go to point three. Point two, I won't be able to get through. Point two is dynamic. Here's what people miss in the book of Acts. The book of Acts. I'll come back next time and talk about this. In the book of Acts, see, people only see one, only see one Pentecost in the book of Acts. Four, 
four. You should see four. You should see four. Acts two is the start. The start. When I come back next time, we'll talk about it. And why? If you, once you under once you understand the four Pentecost in the book of Acts and why it will change that book forever in your life. And change it forever. So let me go to point three and close. There is a distinction between Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's baptism of the church age believer. Well, I can't do that either. Well, let me call it a night. These are both too heavy. Uh, as far as amount of information. So let me hold this and come back next time. You okay with that? I can't do it. I can't, I can't teach either one of these in uh, eight minutes. <laughs> There's no way I can do that. I should have known it when I did this to begin with. Now, look. As we wrap this thing up tonight, you come to church with me. You sit in a session and we go through a lot of information. We go through a lot of material. And often you get overwhelmed by it. Look, here's what you, what I'm interested in your Bible study. Of course we give you a lot. Sure, we expect you to have dog bakes. We have different levels of growth in here. We have different, we have really strong spiritual mature believers in the word. We have immature believers in the word. We have babies in the word. We have, and so often you're overwhelmed. Look, that's not the secret. It's not how, look, it's not how much food is on the table. Is what, what food did you like that was on the table that you ate that would bring you back to the table? You should be able to come to Bible study, be overwhelmed by the amount of material because it's smorgasbord. It's how much you eat. It's how much you eat. It's what you're able to get that keeps you functional. How much do you fight over? How much do you fight about with it? Those are the issues that are key to your life. The word of God should make you uncomfortable. It should challenge you to what you believe. It does me all the time. These are good things. It's a process. Eating the word of God is just like food in the sense that's why it's used as an analogy. It is good for you. It is good for you. And the word of God, whether it's milk or meat or whatever it is, is going to be good for you. It just depends on how much of it you can digest. It's fine. It's fine. Get something. Why would you go to a great mortgage boat, sit down, and eat nothing? Then the question is, what's your motivation? These are the things you must ask yourself. These are the things that are vitally important to your life spiritually. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way today. Set through this Bible study as we've prepared our study on the ministry of the Holy Spirit that begins with Christ coming into the world the ministry we're talking about 
where Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit one day. And we talked about a little bit about the history in this hour. It's a phenomenal. I mean, when you read it, you just go, it's just overwhelming how God introduced the Holy Spirit with the coming of Christ and how Jesus, as he began to prepare, he said, look, I'm leaving, but he's coming. We've been preparing you for this. Boy, if we get nothing from this study, we ought to be getting something about the dynamics of the Holy Spirit who, who lives inside the person who believes that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and saved by grace through faith and not of themselves or some kind of system outside of what Christ has done for them. Oh, Father, I just pray you and encourage our hearts. May we, may we be the people that have the good news and the message of great joy, joy to the world. I mean, we have it. There's so many people sad, beaten up, beaten down. They don't have the joy, don't think it's even possible to get it and doesn't believe in it anymore. And we live among them with the absolute truth and they've been, they've been hooked into a lie. May we be the people to freedom in Jesus' name. Amen.